Thank you so much for joining us. This is a very exciting topic for me. I love everything regarding uh, shopping. I just love the ability. I'm also a shopper myself. So everything related to stores and products and setup and, you know, getting the most out of your money just, you know, makes me very excited. So, and I'm also super, super thrilled to have Kirk Williams here with us, one and only one of the most influential BBC experts uh, for the year. So uh, thank you and congrats on the honors there, Kirk. So thank you for joining us once again this morning. You're going to be taking the lead today, and I'm just going to be here to, to also be just another listener uh, to hear from your expertise, uh, to kind of learn more about that. I was just telling you that I have a client that I'm working on uh, with 17 stores, so this is also great. I'm going to be taking some notes in here, maybe asking you some of my own questions, but uh, to everyone that's not able to join us, we will be sharing the recording uh, shortly after this, so make sure... Um, to, to be able to rewatch it afterwards. So Kirk, why don't we go ahead and let the people know a little bit more about you first, uh, if that sounds good. And then from there, we can go ahead and get started. Yeah, sounds good. Um, cool, yeah, I own I own Zato. So we're a Google Ads, Microsoft Ads agency, really focused just on you know e-commerce, paid search. Although within paid search, as you know, within Google, you have YouTube and Pmax and shopping and all that as well. Um, yeah, I live in, I live in Montana. Uh, so love to do the whole like Montana thing, hiking, running away from grizzly bears, skiing in the winters, all that, <laughs> all that stuff. I have six kids, so there's a lot to, lot, lot to do. I build Legos, build Star Wars Legos. So lots that's, of fun stuff. That's really fun. Um, how old are the kids? If from 13 to three. Okay. And the three-year-old, we, we were a little nervous, like six. We were like, man, I hope, you know, our last doesn't kind of get, you know, buried in the mix. He is like, he controls our lives. Like he is, he is boss, <laughs> baby. We all know it. <laughs> That's nice to so, hear. Yeah. Yeah. How, do you have kids? No, no. Well, I, I have two cats. So I'm a, I'm a proud cat. Oh, there parent, you go. Uh, but uh, no, no kids <laughs> as of the moment. Uh, you know, who knows what the future holds for us. I do love, um, I have my best friend who is almost like a brother to me. He has a daughter. And uh, so it's it's always nice to be kind of that cool um, uncle, but not not nearly yeah. as, as intense as it would be to maybe be a, a dad, really. Be, being an uncle is great. I love it too, yeah. The, half of the responsibility for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah all the fun stuff send them all with the parents <laughs> good man so uh, once again thank you so much for being here i i know you have a lot of really cool practical tips on how to get the most out of shopping campaigns so uh we can go ahead and get right into the agenda and see what we have in store for today yeah, definitely. So, you know, my my hope is is going to be a little bit of a fire hose of information. And Daniel, you know, feel free to hop in, interrupt me whenever if you have, you know, client story to share or something to add, you know, definitely great. Um, as we get into just shopping ads and Pmax and feeds, there's just a lot to talk about. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to talk a little bit about everything. And so we'll just, you know, we'll just keep rolling on everything, but we're, we're really going to try to talk about a big picture shopping ads, PMAX campaigns, you know, what it is, spend a little bit of time there. Cause there might be people on the call who are, you know, newer. Um, and then also just the role of the product feed. We'll talk a little bit about merchant center next, since that's new. And then we'll head into just how you can find some insights from the black box and, um, and then go to Q and A after that. So. Sounds like a great plan. Let's cool, do it. Cool. All righty. Uh, so let's let's start. Yeah, let's start with shopping ads and, and Pmax campaigns. So um, as probably a lot of people are, are aware of, like shopping ads was really Google's first foray into, I think, away from more of a text-based search result pages, um, search engine result pages. So before shopping ads, most of Google advertising was basically your text ads, right? So all of a sudden on comes this really interactive visual, you know, you, you get to see the consumer gets to see what they want to see for the information. So it's one of the reasons why I've always loved shopping ads is because you can see the image, you can see the price. Um, and, and, you know, that's, you would create those with standard shopping campaigns that's been around for years on, onto the scene burst this, this P max thing. So we had smart shopping campaigns. Um, but then, but then that morphed quickly into P max, P max killed them pretty quickly. And P max is all of the above. So whereas standard shopping tends to be 
query based. Like I noted, it tends to be more on the search end of things. So someone is saying, hey, I'm interested in this. They're, they're showing you their search intent. I'm interested in Lego Star Wars. Then you show us standard shopping. Pmax is, is, is more than query based. I like to say it's kind of like goal targeted because really what you're doing is you're telling Google, I want to, maybe I want I have this budget. I have, I want to get as many sales for maybe this target ROAS. And then Google is going on all the channels. So not just search, they're hitting GDN and even Gmail and YouTube. So I don't even think people always understand, like you can, you can appear on Gmail with Pmax campaigns. Um, and, and so it tends to be a little bit more goal targeted and less about a specific what someone types in. Uh, and, and, and in that way, Pmax really is, I think, Google's end game, if you will, for e-commerce. Um, I don't, you know, I, I can't speak to what all is going to happen with search and shopping in the future. But really, you know, this is Google's way of saying, hey, just give us a, a couple of things, a couple of goals, and we'll go and find your user wherever they are across the web. You know, all the promises um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make the evil, I'm not going to make the tie to the evil ring and Mordor and all that, you know, someone else can, but there you go. The one campaign rule mall, the Pmax is taking over everything. <laughs> there we go. Probably yeah, let's stay goals, to be honest, you know, um, yeah. and you know, being at the marketing live earlier this year, they were talking a little bit about all the updates that are basically coming soon. And, and I think we can all safely say that eventually we're going to be in this like keyword less word. Uh, so that's, yep. that's a little bit of what, what we're expecting to see. Yep. Yep. Uh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Let's pick it up here. Um, and so just, just a brief overview of which ads are showing within Pmax. So your Pmax campaign is eligible to appear on, you can, you can show as text ads and SERPs. You can, that's search engine result pages. You can show as those shopping ads we talked about, there will be static asset ads where, that's the that's the at, those are the assets you give or also Google can pull those assets from your site as well at times um, or dynamic product ads. Uh, go ahead and next slide. And uh, for DPA, I just wanted to at least address this quickly because not everyone understands what's going on here. You've probably seen those ads with those product images on the side. There is that example. Um, so basically what Google does with, let's say, dynamic remarketing, which most of us are familiar with, is uh, if you know someone visits your site and hits these, let's say, these four different products, Google will show exactly those four products across the web on, in, in, in a dynamic product ad. Um, what what not, not everyone knows is that there's also something called dynamic prospecting that Google is doing where they're also showing product ads, they can show very specific product images uh, to users based on like user information they have, you know, login Chrome information, stuff like that. So, so Google basically says, hey, this person, we think they're going to want to see these four specific product images, pr products, once they have enough information and they might show those. So just because you see a DPA doesn't actually mean it, it's remarketing, it could be prospecting. And just one practical tip there just to be aware of is in order for this to work correctly, you do have to make sure that your feed product ID does match the ID that's in the structured markup on your on your product detail page on your PDP. And that's how Google, you know, finds the correct product to, to show in that ad. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so as we kind of think through differences here, um, what do you as the PPC -er do? Uh, so with with Pmax, um, is it, Pmax is funny because it's like, oh man, there's so many things you can do. You can uh, like add in search themes and audiences and ROAS targets and assets and that. Next slide. Uh, but here's the deal. So and and this is our expectation, right? We're we're like the guide. So we're guiding Pmax. And so I live in Montana, and it's 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 kind of like we have this idea of like, well, if I'm guiding Pmax, that means I'm like telling them, hey everyone, here's here's where we're supposed to go to go on this mountain, right? And next slide. Uh, the reality is that with Pmax, it's a little bit more, it's like less of you telling Pmax where to go and you at times being like, whoa, no, don't, don't run off that clip. And Pmax is like, no, nah, we're going to anyways, right? So it's really, I just think it's really important at least, at le very least to keep in mind that the information you're giving to Pmax really is like, sig it is, sig they are signals, they're guides. You're telling Google overall, here's, here's the information, or here are the goals and, and that that I want you to try to hit. Google still maintains a ton of control over that. So just keep that in mind. Even things like budget isn't 
isn't isn't um, necessarily a hard target, right? Because they could spend up to double your budget as long as within monthly period, I think it's like 30.4, it averages out to and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so again, just keep that in mind. So next slide. Um, yeah, so, and then, and then with shopping, so shopping, uh, you know, you as the human can um, create the campaigns and then you can set up bids and, and budgets and feed optimization. Go ahead and the next slide. But with shopping, there's actually a fairly a, a decent amount of control there still is. And this is one of the reasons why um, there's still a number of accounts where we've either switched back to standard or at the very least, we're definitely, standard is definitely a significant part of our strategy because with standard shopping, you still, especially in the right accounts, can maintain quite a bit of control over over the, the query side of things. And so one of the things we like doing is kind of this query filtering strategy. And you can check online for this. There's I've written a how-to specifically on this. There's other ones as well um, where I walk through very specifically how to set this up. But the idea being that there still are like like search queries are still a, a like human communicating to you what they're interested in, right? There's there, there's still this communication and this intent based in search queries. And so what you can do with standard is still have some overall grouping based on the level of, of, of purchase intent. So what I mean by that is you might have a whole lot of people searching for generic terms like toys and someone specifically searching for this exact like Lego Millennium Falcon ID, which as a person who builds Lego Star Wars, like we do know the exact IDs of, of like we are searching for specific sets, right? And so the person who's doing that is more likely to purchase. They're they're further down the funnel, if you will. And so like you want to you want to bid more aggressively on that. Like I want more of my budget and bids for my clients going to those terms where people are more likely to convert than just this super generic stuff. We still find value in 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 a segmentation like that with standard shopping. So there are definitely times where we're still doing that, even as we're utilizing and testing PMAX. So I, I just think it's worth calling that out. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so that's, that's kind of the initial opening. I don't know if Daniel, if you have any thoughts, otherwise we'll get into product feeds after that. No, I think we can jump into the product feeds. No, no worries. I think that one of the things that if maybe I can say one thing here is that depending on the account size, I think that oftentimes, you know, one might pick, like you said, standard shopping over Pmax. Yeah. And when the size is right and you have enough budget to kind of work around, what I've seen a lot work is uh, doing a combination of both where you have that standard shopping as kind of like for your top products. And then you have this like Pmax as a second priority option. Um, and that's a setup that you can do when when budget allows. So it's, it's kind of a nice way to structure it. Yeah, I, I think that's a great call out. And part of what we'll be talking about is, you know, is segment our segmentation strategies and how to think through that. And and I think, you know, what you noted I think some of the skill of a PBC -er in as we move into more of these this like AI machine learning sort of realm is kind of determining those things like having the understanding of how the system works. So then strategically you can say, hey, this is the correct setup for this specific account to test and, and move forward with, right? Because because you know to your point, it does depend. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk feeds. And then we'll get into some of that like segmentation thoughts um, as well as insights. So, so feeds. So uh, the product feed is kind of the core of your shopping ads. And, and, and because PMAX still is based, at least e-commerce PMAX is still based primarily around shopping. Um, it's, you know, real important for that as well. So it's one of the key ways that you can optimize PMAX campaigns. And a quick refresher on feeds, you know, for those who this is new to, like a feed is basically, think of it like a spreadsheet, as you can see. Um, so basically, you know, you have a product, which is a row in your spreadsheet. And actually one of the ways that you can create a feed is literally creating a Google sheet. And you can say, here's here you match up Google's product attributes. And the reason why that's so important is because Google's product attributes are how Google is matching what your user is searching for with standard shopping to that product. Or, you know, with Pmax, it's even that like user, the demographics, the audience, the, the other contextual information that Google has on it for Pmax. It's also utilizing your product feed attributes to match those. So kind of the takeaway there is like, 
even though there are certain required attributes in your feed, really the, the more attributes and the more you can fill those out, the better chance you have of telling Google here, here's the information that, that we want to find the right people. Um, just a quick overview of the different types of product feeds is you have the, the API, which is more of a real time. It's, it's more like a real time connection. That's typically my favorite, although there's just going to be a whole lot of it depends and, and what's ideal for everyone. But API tends to be like, let's say if you use Shopify, there, there are just going to be various apps out there. I like some process. Um, and so that, that tends to be a direct connection. So as you update a product, let's say in Shopify, then it automatically sends that specific update to, to Google Merch Center real time. Um, other, other times, this is a little bit more of an older method, but also there are benefits to it is more of like a file upload, if you will. And this is where a lot of third party feed providers like a uh, feednomics, data feed, watch, go data feed. Those, those will come in one of the benefits to them, because there's going to be variations of what they charge and what services they provide. One of the benefits to them is that sometimes increasingly they're moving into also the feed optimization space. I've noticed where you can utilize them to not only you know, cr like basically take all of your product information, put it into the correct format and then push it to Google Merchant Center. But they're, they're increasingly, I think, rolling out ways to optimize that and stuff like that as well. Um, if you're if you're a small brand and you don't really have a lot of changes, I think Google Sheets is still a great way to do it. It's quick, it's easy, and then you can just update it as you go. It's free. Um, or the website crawl, which is still... You know, Google's trying to move more and more into that direction. There's still so many, like, so much that's broken with website crawling. Um, so I guess just, like, be aware that that's happening. I typically shut this option off if, if Google's, like, enabled it in our in our accounts because yeah. it just, things break. Um, so, yeah. Eventually, yeah, I, I think, think that is, yeah. Yeah, go I, ahead. I was just going to say, like, one, one of the things that, for me, kind of makes the biggest difference here is, and we see this especially with, like, brand new stores, it's like, we try to kind of, educate them around the, the the best technical decision you can make here is what storefront you pick. Um, and if you pick the right storefront, like the the right kind of, I'm not going to call it like a, like a you know, content management system, but like if you choose, for instance, Shopify over like this custom website that doesn't support any integrations, you know, that that's going to set you up for success in the long run. As long as, of course, it makes financial sense for you. Obviously, different storefronts have different pricings and things like that, but I think Shopify is relatively on the affordable end uh, for, for most guys. And um, that enables you to have that constant update because, you know, the, the, the thing that could potentially go wrong for you here or like the worst case scenario is you're advertising for products that are potentially out of stock. Uh, that could be one of the things that could go wrong. Um, or you could potentially get disapproved because of a mismatch of data and things like that. So uh, those are kind of the most important things to kind of keep in mind. But as long as you kind of made a good decision initially on like what storefront you were using that, that can always set you up for success in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And so then as someone's kind of thinking through this, um, you know, mm -hmm. someone might be thinking, well, hey, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and transition my feed, you know, to maybe one of those other solutions. Uh, let me just give a couple of quick tips. If you are thinking about changing your feed, just, just be cautious, be real cautious and slow to change your IDs because Google does have history on the back end of Google Merchant Center that they attach to those IDs that can work in your favor. If sometimes, sometimes you want to like change the ID to, to like, if Google is just hammering some product with a random disapproval and it, that, that's like not, not actually fair. It's not, you know, we all have stories of that. You can sometimes change the ID. Otherwise, the last thing you want to do when you're changing your feed provider is to un unwittingly change all your IDs and reset all of your history. And so just be aware of that. Then you can go to the next slide. And then a second thing on that is actually, um, not, I find a lot of people don't know this, but you, you can actually also reset your history by when you switch out that feed container. So um, you, you have to create your new feed first, get that into Merge Center, make sure all of that's good. Then once you're ready and you've tested everything, then remove that old feed. Um, and I understand we'll get their merch center next. It's 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 called different things and all that. But still, the concept, to my understanding, is there for next as well, which would be, hey, if you are transitioning your feed and you have that idea, make sure to put that new one in before before you you move that old one. So go and go to the next slide. Um, and then yeah. Good, anyone paying attention, like Google cha has changed like, yeah, G4, 
Google Ads, UI, and now GMC. Google Merchant Center is changing. Next slide. Um, and so this is in September. So just be aware of that. So uh, Google's announced that I believe as of September, they're going to be, I think they said all accounts are, are moving to next. So definitely start getting in there and being aware of that. Uh, next slide. Yeah, some changes, some different things that I think is just helpful to be aware of. Uh, there are just some like name differences. Data feeds are now product sources, supplemental feeds, feed rules, content API. They're, they're named different things. So just be aware of that. Things are moved around. They're named different things. You can go to the next slide. Um, and, and one thing just to be aware of with, with supplemental sources, feeds, and, and feed rules, this was something that Google recently enabled, um, which is awesome. And uh, what they'll do if they are... Uh, if you have an account currently as a classic that has feed rules or supplemental feeds, if they if they migrate you to a next account, those will transition over for you. So just be aware of that. So that's that's great news. So if you're using a supplemental feed, that's going to also appear in next. So thanks, Google, for working on that. However, helpful to know this, um, because if you don't actually have that and you get a new next account, and you want to create a supplemental feed, you're gonna look and be like, where the heck is supplemental sources? It's not here. You actually have to like turn that on, which I don't know, just kind of weird, but you know, you can you can see how to do that later, but here's the steps to do that. You gotta go into add-ons and turn that on and then you'll have supplemental feeds. So be aware of that. It's one of those tips that if if, if you're not aware of that, it, like it would drive you nuts. Once you know that, it's like helpful to have some. Next slide. Um, and so let's, let's talk briefly about optimizing product feed. Um, so if I had, like we get a new account and let's say we just had a short amount of time. These, these are probably the five attributes that I would, I would focus on. Uh, get as much attributes as you can. If you only had a little time, these, these five, will, you'll probably get the biggest bang for your buck as it goes. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of those with specific tips. So you can move to the next one, starting with title. Um, so product title, probably I think the most important one that you could invest your time on. Um, product title just still has, you know, pretty significant impact if, from what we've seen and tested in terms of Google's, Google's rankings. So if you just have really crummy product titles and you change those, um, you, you might actually see immediate growth in impressions and, and, and traffic. Um, there's a lot of different ways to create a product title title. I'm sure Daniel has thoughts on that as well. I found that, you know, a couple of strategic things to keep in mind, like get the most important terms and keywords, um, uh, like front those in the beginning of the title, you know, as, as much as possible. And then, um, I do try to have some sort of, um, I, I try to have some sort of a, uh, a format for different industries and, and how we think about them. So as one example, like we do a lot of bike shops for whatever reason at Zato. And, um, and what I found is just like, I'm actually a road biker. And what I found is like, because again, people, people tend to know, people tend to be loyalists to a, a brand. People tend to be loyalists even to a model. Like if you ride like Trek Damani, like that's what you're looking for. And then there's even things like, you know, like, people who prefer disc brakes as opposed to rim brakes. And, and so people are searching for those sort of things. And so those are the sort of things where the more you understand your industry, if people are searching for that, those are the things to test in a title uh, to, to try to get Google to rank you higher for certain things so that you will better align with actually how people are searching. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. And, one and can, you know, one, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that one thing that I'd like to add in terms of the title is, um, if you have brand name, absolutely brands got to be first, but if you're, for instance, you're working with a store that doesn't have a particular brand name that's actually recognized or anything like that. And you're introducing, for instance, if you're introducing a, a novelty product or a very niche product and, uh, what you want to definitely try out on the title is going to be to prioritize how people would be searching for that specifically. Um, and so just kind of think of it that way, like the order of operation is how likely people are to find it that way. Um, and of course, for anything that's brand oriented, it's always going to be brand first. So, so just keep that in mind, but just kind of keep it open to where depending on that individual product, product category and how people potentially choose one brand over another or one product over another, um, you might have the ability to win that, um, let's say auction, so to speak, by trying out different things and, and kind of moving things around a touch. 
And then also, you know, quick tip is always do some previews of how other competing products are shown. Uh, so you kind of get a sense of what is the competition doing within that certain specific product category or sector. And another pro tip is be mindful of how it's going to display uh, on mobile because everyone's doing mobile searches nowadays more so than they're doing the desktop searches. And therefore, keep in mind that length of characters that's going to show. So if you're thinking of what's going to be most important to show, like obviously that's going to be a big differentiating factor. So those are some of my tips for that. Love it. Yep. T totally agree. And, and your first point is such a great point too, um, which, which again is like, yes, there's some format that helps, but then, but then figure out for your industry, what works best. Cause to your point, it is not always a good idea to put, to, to put brand first. Um, so, you know, and then as you're, you know, another tip for as you're, as you're just looking to determine, Hey, what keywords are those? Like Daniel was saying, what keywords are those that people actually are searching for? One of the things I like doing is like utilizing the information you have within your search terms, especially if you have history in your account and just seeing, Hey, what are terms that people are searching for and converting on? Um, so there might be ways that you'll, you'll filter for, you know, high, high efficiency, high sales type terms and see, are, are there ways where we can appear on more of those sort of terms? You can go to the next slide and then I'll pick, you know, like a product type or specific brand and we'll, and we'll test that, um, that specific, uh, you know, that, that test keyword modifier, if you will, um, go into the next, to the next slide and then, and then you can monitor how those terms that you called out are actually doing. Um, so here's an example of a client few, few years ago. Um, so your mileage absolutely will vary and this is not normal, but it is an example of, there are times where you can do a title test and, and significantly increase exposure on the term that you're trying to target just by putting it in the title. In this example, we like more than doubled impressions, literally just with, with testing like core terms that our, our client or our customers were searching for. So go to the next slide. Um, and so then let's, let's talk description. Um, and I'll, I'll try to move it along here so that we kind of make it through some other things, but just, uh, some quick thoughts on description would just be get that information that you don't quite have time for in the, or room for in the title, because Google also utilizes that. But, you know, we've probably all had clients where, um, or accounts where, you know, especially like, let's say Shopify is pulling from a product and you get like three sentences in the description that they, they grab. So I, I think it actually works great at times to utilize chat GPT to grab that, uh, to build you new descriptions and, and throw that in. And you can get pretty specific. Here's a, a prompt that I actually used for a client where um, we got pretty specific, even in saying like how to, how to create the description, character length, you can go to the next slide. And here's an example of like what it spit out. And so we just, we were able to grab this really helpful information. And then we also, then I was curious, I was like, actually like, yeah, give me, give me specific product type um, information and hierarchy based on this as well. And it, and it, and it spit out a pretty decent product type as well. So I think there are ways, this tip is just like, Hey, if you're not already like experiment with ways to utilize this to better fill out and optimize your, your product. Uh, attributes. So you can go to the next slide. The last, the last attribute we'll talk about is product type. And it's just quick noting. I, I still like to call this one out because I still see this so underutilized. It's amazing to me how many times I'll take over an account and it's not even used. And like product type is used is, has been announced by Google as being part of their backend ranking. So it is actually a ranking attribute. Um, so like get it in your, get it in your feed. That's like the number one tip. And then they say, you know, utilize three, at least three tiers, be descriptive. You can go to the next slide. One of the reasons I like product type is because you are communicating yes to Google. Like here's the contextual information of how we see our product relating to other products. That's how Google uses it for ranking. But also I think product type makes a lot of sense as part of segmentation, Ken, be because in a lot of ways, like product types, I find often do mirror like audiences in some ways, like, like you, you typically have different people who are looking for different sorts of things. Not always. I get that. Um, especially if you, if you sell like, you know, one thing, you just sell bicycle lights, like, you know, it's only going to be help you so much for product type, but there are a lot of times where your product type actually can be useful, especially I find with asset groups, because then you can organize your, your images and your assets around that. And so then you can better target people who are searching, let's say for swimwear, as opposed to people who are searching for like winter woolly parkas and, you know, because that's, those are different things. So 
I'll go ahead and head to the next slide. Um, and, and that, that kind of wraps up the feed section. Anything you want to hop in there with Daniel, or should we continue moving on? I would say that the the one thing that I, I would probably say in regards to the feed optimization um, is again test it test 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 that's kind of the the moral of the story and I would say that uh, especially if you're going to test it out and you're working with a feed that's got thousands of products our our you know recommendation is not to change all four thousand right it's you know because what you what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out the best approach with maybe a few of the products that actually are getting traffic or some of the products that you want to move that aren't really moving at all. Um, and so just kind of start there so you can then replicate it across the board, but don't think you need to go ahead and optimize all 4,000 titles at once if you don't have the capability technically to do that. Uh, so don't feel too bad if you can, then you're overwhelmed. No, that's not the case. It's just figure out the right approach with a few select products. That's why it's a test. That's why it's an experiment. Yeah, I love it. It's, it's kind of the 80-20 rule, right? Um, most brands have like those core products that are their best sellers. So yeah, definitely invest 80% of your time optimizing those. Um, so yeah, good call. Uh, okay, let's let's continue on. I'm going to try to blast through this, this section a little bit. Um, campaign segmentation is interesting. Like sometimes I hear people talk about campaign segmentation. And it's almost like they're like, hey, we have this magic thing. It works every time. This is always how you have to do it. That's just not the way that I, I've seen PMAX work. Um, I, I just think there are uh, like there are a variety of different ways to it. So my goal here is just to like give you some tips on some different ideas. And, and again, to Daniel's testing point, then it's kind of up to you to really figure out what is working best in your specific account. Because there's so many different things that work into this in terms of like auction costs in your industry and audiences and all this stuff. So um, the, the thing with campaign segmentation, like let's just like let's look high level for a second would be. You know, as you think of, okay, the difference between campaigns and asset groups, if you will. So campaigns with PMAX allows you to, you, you can set uh, more targeted budgets and ROAS targets, especially. And there are some other changes too. Those are probably kind of two big ones. So I think it's really helpful to think through, okay, in terms of the big groupings, how do I want to segment out my products so that I can give Google different like efficiency targets and, and, and budgets and that sort of thing. And then I think move more towards then like, okay, within those, then subdivide, okay, then how should assets be thought through and audiences? And then, and then that's where to me, asset groups come in. So on, on kind of the big picture campaign segmentation idea, I think there are a number of ways that like will, will test, um, you know, different ways of segmenting, uh, especially according to budget and ROAS targeting. A couple of my favorites, you can go to the next slide, uh, like on that campaign segmentation, that was just a list of them. Oh, and sorry, I forgot about this. And, and as you're thinking, um, or, sorry, go to the conversion data slide. <laughs> um, as you're thinking, we're, we're doing pretty well for, you know, doing like the whole, um, for me telling you, Daniel, like uh, where to go and stuff. I'm going to give us like team. an A. We're good team. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yes. Anyways, uh, so in terms of conversion data, by the way, too, like sometimes I see people and they're like, hey, you know, we have like 100 products and we have like 25 PMAX campaigns. You're like, no, I mean, you know, with, with like 200 clicks a month or whatever it might be. It's like, no, that's way too over segmented. Just, just to have this in your brain, um, Mike Ryan, SMEC software company, uh, he did an analysis of like, quite a bit, I think like a billion dollars or so of, of, of um, analysis of revenue in that. And uh, they determined, like he's, he just kind of demonstrated that, hey, the best, uh, the best chance to determine whether or not you're giving Google the best information would be at least 150 sales per month. Um, so that's kind of a target to give you. Obviously, Pmax can do well with less than that. But, but it does give you an, an idea of the fact that like PMAX does need enough information. So don't just go crazy camp segmenting if you don't have a lot of data. Um, now you can go to the next slide. Uh, a, a couple of, of ways we like to segment. Miles McNair and I chatted on a podcast. You can listen to that episode. Uh, so basically historical performance, how are your previous products actually performing if you have data? And really it's pretty, it's as simple as just like, Hey, let's make sure we give as much gas as possible to like our top products. Kind of like we were discussing, um, you're just segmenting those out. And then, and then things like, let's say villains products that are taking a lot of cost and not performing, make sure those are, are doing less, um, you are getting, are getting less budget. And then, um, go ahead and next slide. Uh, I really love the zero click ghosts, zombies, lots of different words. I love the zero click campaigns. Um, so we'll, we'll like 
here, here's an actual campaign that I looked at one time for an audit and they had 350,000 products in one asset group and one campaign and only 50 of those products even had sales. I think like a thousand of them had clicks. I mean, so Google was doing its job. It was just like, Hey, we're going to run after the products doing the most. And this client had like 300 and some thousand products that just like, like what else could be done with this? Um, and so go ahead to the next slide. So what you can do is just uh, pull those zero click products, utilize filters and Google ads reporting, pull those into their own spreadsheet, custom label that, enter that as a supplemental feed. I'm blasting through this, these steps for the sake of time and then create a new campaign. You can do Pmax, you could do standard shopping if you wanted to test that as well with those zero click products. And basically you're just saying like, hey, let's get these, these products where Google, Google hasn't even given the time date. It's not like Google determined these didn't sell well because of testing. Like they didn't even have the budget to go after them with the data that they had. So like, let's let's give them some budget and see how it does. So that's that's one of the ways I like to segment out. Go ahead and the next slide. Um, and then feed only PMAX campaign is kind of a popular one. A, a couple of quick thoughts on that. Just be aware of the fact that um, in order to set this up, you actually need to remove that final URL. People don't always do that. Um, but this kind of puts you a little bit into like an old school smart shopping campaign. Some people really like that because they saw smart shopping work well in the past. If, if you want more control, my thought would be maybe just test query, the query filtering standard shopping stuff that I talked about in the beginning, because that'll give you more of that control. And then just be aware that feed only at this point, because Google can grab assets automatically from your product page. It's not even really truly asset list at this point, but sometimes it's worth testing some. And you can go ahead. Um, let's let's go ahead and skip this next one. Yeah, we won't talk about new customer acquisition. Well, real quick, um, people don't always realize this, but when you add in a customer acquisition value, you are communicating additional value to Google. Um, so so just be aware of the fact that like if you add in a customer acquisition value, that means Google is adding in this case sixty three dollars and eighty cents to every sale that comes through as a new customer in in Google. And so that's inflated value. Like, just be aware of that. I don't think people always know that. So like in this case, like that's $91,000 of inflated value because it's based on LTV, but, and, and you might want that as part of your equation. Just be aware of that fact. Um, I, I honestly don't know if anyone is following me right now with this, but like probably for some people utilizing it, just be aware of the fact that you are adding in inflated value in there and you might not be aware of it. Um, so be careful of that. Uh, so uh, we can go to, I think the next, yeah. So this is, this is kind of the last section and Daniel, I'm going to leave this up to you. We can, we can try to zip through some insight stuff real quick on the black box stuff, or we can just, you know, move to a Q and a, I took a little longer than I thought on those last sections. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that up to you. I think we what, can run I'll through like some to... of this because it, it, there's still a lot of questions from people around. How do I learn more about, how my Pmax campaign is running, how do I get more yeah. data so that I can make decisions on it? So it's still really kind of pretty relevant. Uh, so if you want, we can uh, just pick one or two of these and, and run through them. Cool, cool. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, so again, kind of that big picture thing would be you have a performance dip that happens. And so one of the one of the biggest things to me is like determine is this just Pmax a Pmax campaign you need to dig into or if if it's all campaigns then it's probably not necessarily a black box Pmax issue, but it could just be a big picture like is your conversion tracking down is there like did upper funnel marketing get paused and that sort of thing. So sometimes the first thing is just like is 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 like analyzing whether this is actually a Pmax issue. Or is this like some bigger marketing thing? Um, so you can you can go ahead. You can skip past this next slide too. I had a fun little client story, but we'll skip past it. Let's say you do determine this is a Pmax issue. Um, even though it's a black box, you know we are getting increased insights and reports from Google. So I think I think I think you have to shift your thinking a little bit on this. Um, and and sometimes this means especially like your boss or your clients helping them shift their thinking a little bit too is that like what you're doing with the PMAX insights and reporting is not necessarily looking for this exact smoking gun. Although sometimes you'll find that what you're looking for is like, you, you need to become a really smart detective in, in trying to start to see like, what are some, some 
areas of suspicion that I should look further into and then start to know the questions to ask to actually arrive at the problem. So even though it's a black box, I think, I think there are still things that, that it'll show you. So as, as examples, so like, I like to look through some certain reports, like let's say we've seen there's been a P PMAX performance drop. Products report is one of the first places I look at because I'm just trying to determine what sort of performance drop are we talking about? Like, and so is this, is this a product? And what you can do is analyze that time frame of your performance drop and just look, just look immediately previous to that. And I like to just try to determine, okay, are there specific products that have changed drastically that the rest of the products haven't? And sometimes, and again, this is one of those things where when it's obvious, it's obvious. And if not, that's fine. Go, go find something else. But um, you can go to the next slide. But when, but it, let's say you do find that it's a couple of those products, then again, that's where you have to enter that detective mode where you're like, okay, hey, it looks like what happened in this drop with performance that we saw in this insights was like, it's these, it's this specific product and this is their core product. That might not tell you exactly what the problem is, but now that you know that, now you can engage the client. You can, you can start looking into things like, like we've had it before where competitors change their pricing and that influenced our sales. And, and we just didn't really notice that other than starting to look through some of these things. So even though it's a black box in some ways, I just really still think that you can get certain insights by knowing what to look for. Um, so, you know, why don't you go to the next one? Um, we'll just real quick go over like placements and, and placement type reports is a, is a good one to be aware of, especially being aware of how much mobile apps go to the next slide. Um, we've had, we've had an instance, you know, we've had instances for sure where, um, even though you can only see impressions with this stuff, if, if you're not happy with PMAX performance and you do dig into this and realize, Hey, the majority of our impressions are coming from apps. It's probably time to exclude apps. Go to the next slide. One of the visuals I really like in this report is the line report. Um, because that can, that can actually that goes beyond averages and does start to like show you something. And here, this, this, <laughs> this is one of those times where like, yeah, I, I like, I want to show this to Google because it's a, it's a good example of like, here's sometimes why we have trust issues as PPCers because <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll say like, Hey, you know, trust the system, right? What happened in this instance, see that massive spike. That was a, that was a client sale. And uh, what happened is, as you can see is like, so the red line, I'm colorblind. It's either red or green. Um, it's not the blue or the yellow. So that line is mobile apps. And what happened here is Google's like, yeah, mobile apps don't work for this Pmax. So we're gonna we're gonna keep you know pushing this to the web page. And then our clients like, we have a sale. Let's increase budgets. And so Google's like, hey, we have budget to spend. Even though mobile apps has never worked since we have this budget. Let's just surge traffic in mobile apps. And, and part of why we looked into this is because it, like the performance dropped significantly. Well, this was when we were like, well, yeah, they never should have surged mobile apps. We excluded mobile apps from the campaign, you know, moving forward, um, learn our lesson in this account. And uh, it's, it's a good indication of things where you can look into stuff. And, and, and so sometimes, you know, the takeaway would be uh, try different visuals of some of these reports too. Um, and just see if there's if there are little things like this that really start to give you a story of what to do, take it to the client, begin. Like to me, the insights and reports you do get from PMAX are about like identifying suspicious things and beginning conversations to find the real problem. And I think if you look at the black box like that, I, I still think you can get a lot of information. And then you let's go to the search term report. Go ahead. I was just going to say that what, what you said is very nice, which is around becoming, you know, just really, really uh, thorough detectives. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find correlations and then find a way to turn those correlations into or determine if they are causations. Right. That's that's a little bit of what the process is going to be like. Mm -hmm. a absolutely. Um, and, and that might be part of the takeaway would be, you know, the frustration with the black box flip that on its head and turn that into a positive thing for smart marketers. Because if you're frustrated with the black box, you know, so are your clients, right? Man, that means your job is real valuable. If you're the person that they can turn to that can help them think through and find issues, even if there's a black box. So, um, and then here, here are ways to exclude things. Let's go ahead and skip past that. Um, 
We'll skip past that. Let's go to just the search term. Yeah, skip past landing page. That's another one to dig into, landing page report. Um, search terms this site, I'll just note this. This is probably my favorite in, uh, insight report and also uh, one that Google has continually given us more of, which is really helpful. Um, uh, again, like take that performance drop change of, of time frame, uh, you know, as, as accurately, as close as you can with Google's allowable filters. And just try to determine, especially in search terms, like has anything changed significantly on the terms where, where this PMAX campaign is showing on? You can skip ahead to the next slide. There are cool things with engrams that Google's showing us. Skip to the next slide. You can download it, get way more information on the CSV that you can dig through as well and do all of your Excel stuff like pivot tables and things. So just be aware of that if you weren't. And then go to that last slide because then actually take action on that. And so once you have the search terms information, like let's say let's say you've looked at the search terms and you have seen, even if you don't get all of the information that Google wants to show, because they still love hiding stuff that costs and that, but you still can get some insight again into what to do. So you could add those exclusions um, to that specific campaign or add an account if you want, if Google suddenly is running after search terms that no longer are helpful. Or, and again, you know, we talked about this already, but man, do that on the positive side. Maybe there are, are things to to push in as as title optimizations. This, this is just a screenshot from an account where we where we specifically focused on like the niche that this this new client wanted to do by by checking out their PMAX search terms even, and like increased by like a thousand percent their impressions, which again is not. It's not like a case study that doesn't always happen, but it still can sometimes for certain accounts. Um, keeping keeping on the, on those search terms and adding those in, you still can optimize things with titles and all that. So um, even though PMAX is a black box, still a heck of a lot that you can learn from it and and act on with it. So just just kind of dig into that and figure that out. Be the problem solver for your clients or your or your boss or your business if you're on here as a business owner and. Um, and yeah, utilize the black box to your benefit. So that's all I got. All right, perfect. Uh, well, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, and then we can run through uh, some of the questions that came on board. Uh, so I'm going to see if I can find some of the questions here. One second. Yeah, where is that? Oh, sorry, let me just... Go back here to the Q and A here, uh, Emily. If you have the questions there for me, maybe you can uh, read me a couple. Um, but I think, for instance, one thing that I'd like to ask Kirk um, before I kind of head into the Q and A would be: when you're optimizing feed, like how often would you say you find yourself making changes to the feed? So, like if, or, or for instance, if you make any edits to the title, like how aggressive are you with making another one after or how, how long do you let that sit? That's a good question. Um, it's definitely going to depend on the volume of traffic sales, how successful the previous changes were and, and all of that. Right. Um, so as anyone who does any work in PPC understands, like there's just some, some limitations you have on lower volume accounts and products and that where you, you just got to get enough information with enough time to even have confidence in a test. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be, you're going to have that limitation. Um, you know, in terms of, it gets tricky when titles are actually starting to work well. So when, so, so like if we, if we edit a title because you're limited uh, character space as well, right? Yeah. So there's only so many things you can do. So I find myself in a little bit of a conundrum at times. Cause if let's say we edit a title and we're like, Hey, we really want to aim successfully at these specific search terms that we looked at and then we do and we we really see traffic jump and sales and we're happy about it i i start to get a little bit hesitant to do more testing because then i'm a little bit concerned of you know of of like losing those keywords that we identified because we're we're starting to run out of spaces so right. we might try stuff with descriptions or that so again it kind of depends i'll probably be doing more testing you know let's say let's say you have a product that you're really interested in trying to figure out, you know, I'm just going to throw out, you know, probably every, every few weeks or, or month or two, depending on the amount, the volume, if you don't really like the results, you know, you could, you could probably try something, try something else. Once you think you have enough information. Um, 
Yeah. So once once things are really going well, though, with that title, I, I, I do start to get hesitant to change it. I'll be honest. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if it's working, don't break it <laughs> for the most part. Um, we yep. have a we have a nice question here, which is, um, are there certain types of products that work better on standard shopping versus how they would work on a Pmax? Yeah. So I don't think it's products. I think it's almost like industries. Um, and so, so, uh, like, like as my bike shop example, that's one where you have specific people who are typing in very specific things. And if you like, especially with that standard shopping query filtering, if you are able to say, Hey, this group of people and these terms that they search for tends to convert a lot differently than, than this group. I think because it's more search focused, that tends to be one where I find standard can work well because we really can like focus on manipulating budgets and that to for those search queries, right? Um, so those those sort of thing, those sort of industries I find work a little bit better. Um, industries where there is a very I'm, tr I'm trying to think of a very specific example, but what I found is very good and specific niche of audiences. So I've found like, let's just say tools work pretty well with PMAX actually, because there's just like, like, it's almost like Google just knows like this group of people are like DeWalt people. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, it, it's just like, it's just like, so that's an example where like PMAX seems to do really well. Um, so again, I think, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if that's helpful or if you have thoughts on that, but. What I would say, it's also part of what I use as a decision-making process for standard shopping versus Pmax is also going to be like, what's the price range of the products um, and the kind of views that those products are going to be like, what's the rotation? So like, for instance, um, if it's something that you don't have to think a lot about buying, uh, you know, whether that's going to be clothing, for instance, and or for instance, if it's like a... Um, fragrances or, you know, whatever else is kind of like high rotation product um, where there's not really a lot of comparison that you need to do. I, I would say the Pmax is really going to shine um, because just the potential of reach that you have with the Pmax is significantly greater. And whenever your product has like relatively uh, more of a problematic, not problematic, but I guess, you know, you, you really have to fight to be able to win that. Uh, I would say maybe in that case, a standard shopping could be um, more so, you know, an option for you. Or for instance, if um, again, your price range is pretty high and, you know, maybe at that point it could be uh, that a little bit more control will give you that edge to make sure that you're not spending money where you don't have to. Um, we, we would potentially be kind of be a, a sustainable option in the long term. And then I guess the third factor for me would be uh, just how much budget do we have available? Um, and I can assure you that, uh, for instance, I was at the Think Retail last year with Google and they had a speaker from Alta Beauty. Um, and, you know, for the most part, Alta Beauty, they have nationwide campaigns and things like that. So for them, Pmax was a huge success. But again, it goes down to the specific product, cosmetics and everything. The rotation is high. And so, again, kind of think of that in a combination of just like how easy that purchase can be in terms of the purchase cycle, like the complexity of it. And then also just obviously the budget available. So um, outside of that, uh, what I would say is um, I, I think we kind of run out of time here, but you know, if I can maybe throw one more question there, your way is um, how much value do you think that keyword themes or audience signals has? Like how, how much impact do you think that makes uh, in terms of the overall kind of traffic that you're going to get. So like once you've created it, if you change some of the keyword themes around or the audience signals, do you expect to see a big change in performance? <laughs> um, no, but also that's one where I just, I, I like, I'm going to be fully honest. I, I still don't know what I think about that yet because as we've tested things, we haven't really seen significant changes, especially with like audience signals or keyword themes. But also if someone comes in and they're like, Hey, I did something in this account with this specific thing and saw it, I'd be like, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe that's where I like my, my joking guide thing earlier. Maybe that's what part of why I include it because it's just like, I've just really seen them more as signals and guidance, especially early on and, and not really something that you're going to see significantly change things 
um, like for sure, I don't know if we've ever like tested a new audience single, if you will, and just seen like overnight, just wow, changes either for better or worse. Honestly, I, I don't know. What What do you think? Um, I would say for the most part is kind of that initial setup, like you said. Um, and then from there, I think that the biggest differences that you can make is going to be around placement management. Um, it's going to be around uh, managing exclusions. It's going to be around kind of mm-hmm. working with your uh, feed, uh, making sure that your landing page experience is very uh, well set. Um, and I would say for the most part, kind of the signals at the end of the day are signals. And then kind of Google is going to work on those. Um, and so what I would say is, that that's kind of what I would think is the the biggest kind of influence factor in there. But um, once again, I think this is one of those webinar series that can go on forever. And I think we can uh, maybe do a part two on some of the more advanced tactics and things like that, or or maybe do some sort of like a just a Q and A session would be phenomenal. Just you know, kind of that. Um, but Kirk, it's been great to have you on. Uh, thank you to everyone that joined. For everyone that couldn't, again, we're going to be able to send the webinar afterwards. Um, it's been it's been a great experience to have you. Kurt, can you let the audience know where they can find you? Absolutely. And and I'm happy to answer questions too um, on online. I mean, I'm PPC Kirk. You can find me pretty easily on Twitter, LinkedIn. If you have questions, shoot them over. Um, I'll answer them as I'm able to. So if we didn't get to them, so. All right. Well, thank you again, guys. Uh, we'll be sending the recording. We'll find some of the questions on the Q&A that we couldn't do, and maybe we'll do a blog post about it or do a LinkedIn post. Uh, so thank you. And uh, you know where to find us. You can also find us at whitechirkmedia.com on, uh, and on LinkedIn at White Media. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye.